Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to uh, share session three of our uh, life school class, our forerunner school uh, class calling, uh, called Building or Becoming an Eternal Purpose House of Prayer. So uh, this session is session three, uh, which is called uh, Praying for the Corporate Man. Uh, hope you've listened to or watched and read the notes in sessions one and two because each of these sessions build upon the other. Uh, sessions one and two uh, lay a foundation of what a house of prayer is, especially an eternal purpose house of prayer. Uh, session one even connected the summons to the golden altar uh, with uh, the need to pray into God's eternal purpose. So then session two kind of expanded upon that and explaining and reviewing some of the aspects of God's eternal purpose uh, to prepare us. But we make a shift in this session uh, where we begin uh, this session and the three that follow, so four in total, we, we, we begin to talk about various topics that, at least from our perspective, we believe fall into uh, the area of the need to pray into God's eternal purpose. For, for That's the, the intent of the session. We're not really trying to make this a class that focuses on just general principles of prayer. There are many of those classes around uh, and many teachings and books about that, and they're all good. They're, many of those are good. Uh, but we're focusing on the need and the aspects of praying into the, the eternal purposes of God. Uh, along the lines of the eternal blueprint in that class, that forerunner school class, that book that Brian wrote uh, related to that. So in this session, we begin to uh, focus on... <clears throat> Uh, the four main themes uh, that we have highlighted as, a, as, a, as needed uh, and appropriate for God's praying into God's eternal purpose. So anyway, let me, let me open with prayer, uh, and then uh, I want to read a scripture verse, and then we're going to talk about a little bit about those four themes, and then we'll get into this theme for today, which is praying for the corporate man. Uh, so let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the people who are so faithful to want to be a part of uh, your forerunner company, this vessel that you're raising up in the end times to make a people ready for the coming of the Lord. We are so thankful for those who have a heart to do that. Uh, it's such an important, such a timely task in this hour. And so we're so appreciative of the heart of so many who are hungry and thirsty to be a part of this. And we ask, Father, for your sake and for their sake, that you would anoint this session, that you would take me out of the way merely to be a voice for what's on your heart, what's in your mind, that you want to share with your people uh, today. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be strong, to be powerful, to bring, to bring great clarity uh, into this particular topic and to uh, all of the various topics related to uh, praying into God's eternal purpose. So we thank you for these things and we pray them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, I want to read a verse of scripture that we have used in other classes and other, and probably most of you are familiar with it, but it'll set the stage for what we want to do uh, today. It's from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. And let me just read it. A great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor. She was in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, the King James talks about that she was in travail uh, to, to give birth. Uh, then another sign appeared to, in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns on, this, on his head were seven diamonds, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. The dragon was standing before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, <coughs> a male child, a man child, in the King James, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God 
and to his throne. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, it, as we get into this session, but I want to just highlight uh, just the, the three main characters here, the woman, the man-child, and the dragon, because they all kind of enter into this these four themes that we want to pray into as part of praying into God's eternal purpose. So we have the woman, and the, is, the woman is more complicated than what I'm going to say, uh, and so I'm, I'm not trying to do a detailed uh, description and analysis of the woman uh, in this passage, but just to say this, that the woman includes the overcoming saints throughout history, even through the Old Testament and New Testament days, the faithful witnesses of, of, of the book of Hebrews, but it also includes uh, the church in the earth. So there's a heavenly component to it and there's an earthly component to it. And, it's the, uh, and so for our purposes, we want to speak of it as the, as the church uh, upon the earth, the church of today, the church in today's hour. So we see that with the woman. We see also the man-child, and the man-child is the mature church, the overcoming church, uh, the, the, the church that has been made ready, the corporate son uh, for the father. And a, a first fruits aspect of that as the bride uh, made ready. So we see the woman, we see the man child as that. And then we see the dragon. We see the dragon kind of standing before the woman. Uh, the dragon was standing before the, before the woman to uh, abort the birth and to attack the, the, the man child uh, as it's been born, to devour that man child. So, there, so what we see here, we see in, in, our para, in our analysis here, we see the church on the earth birthing this mature, from the womb of the church, birthing this mature man, uh, this corporate son, and we see the enemy, the dragon, the serpent of old, trying to devour us to stop this birth. And so all of these things fit into our call to pray. Uh, to pray into God's eternal purposes. And out of this flows these four, these four themes. So let me just talk about the four themes that, that we would incorporate into our uh, view of praying into God's eternal purpose. The first one is to pray for the mature co corporate man to arise, which would be, a, as we've said in our eternal purpose uh, classes and teachings, this corporate man would be a mature son uh, for the heavenly father, a corporate mature son for the heavenly father, and it would be a bride made ready uh, for the son, a mature son for the father and a bride made ready uh, for, uh, for Christ. So that's, that's the theme, and we're going to talk, that's the primary theme, really. That's the objective of the God's eternal purpose. It's the objective of the church age, and it's the objective, the primary objective for why we're praying in an eternal purpose house of prayer is to see this corporate man arise. Uh, but that's, that's the first thing. And that's what we're going to talk about in this session will be this um, corporate man to give some insight into, into it, into how to pray uh, for this as a part of our house of prayer uh, activities. But there's a second theme uh, the second and the third theme kind of relate to this dragon that's standing before the woman trying to devour the birth of this man-child. And that's the second theme being resisting the great harlot, resisting the great harlot. Uh, and the third one being restraining the spirit of Antichrist, restraining the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, our approach to an eternal purpose house of prayer would include uh, all three of these dimensions. It would include the praying for the corporate man to arise, the bride to be made ready, but it would also include standing against the opposition from the great harlot uh, and from the spirit of Antichrist that would try to hinder or try to abort this birth and to stop or to devour this man-child. Uh, and so we'll get into the great harlot in the next session, session four. Then session five will deal with the restraining of the spirit of Antichrist. 
But there's one more. We'll deal with this one in session six, and that is praying for Israel. Um, so many people would say, would say, well, what does praying for Israel have to do with God's eternal purpose? What does it have to do uh, with, with that? And I can understand the, uh, the discussion on that, and whereas some people who would build an eternal purpose house of prayer may not include that, even though it's, to me it's an important aspect of the church's prayer is to pray for Israel. But there are essentially two reasons uh, why we believe that praying for Israel should be a part of, of God's eternal purpose. Uh, and I'll just mention them, and we'll deal with them in detail in session six. But the two reasons are, one, that when Jesus returns, he will establish his throne on the earth, and his throne will be in Israel. It'll be in Jerusalem. His throne will be in Jerusalem. And there's tremendous opposition uh, to the land, to the state of Israel, the nation of Israel, as it relates to its survival. Uh, and, and so relating in a sense, uh, um, um, an important sense, for Christ's uh, throne, the place where Christ's throne will be established. So that's one of the reasons we include Israel. The second reason is that just as the, uh, just as the Godhead wants a Gentile bride made ready, uh, he also wants a Jewish bride. Now, the Jewish bride must be made ready in Christ. They will only be a part of the bridal company if they come to Christ. Uh, but there is a desire in the heart, we believe, in the heart of the Father for a bride made ready from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation, which would include Israel and which would include the Jewish people. Now, we'll deal with uh, a, a lot of detail about that in session six. So we have kind of highlighted four prayer themes uh, that should be a part of Eternal Purpose House of Prayer. The rising of the corporate man, the re resisting of the great harlot, uh, who would come against uh, the bride being made ready, uh, the restraining of the spirit of Antichrist uh, as well, who would come against the bride being made ready, and to pray for Israel because Christ will dwell there in the millennial kingdom, the kingdom age, and God wants a bride out of the Jewish people for which prayer must take place uh, for all of these things. So these are the four themes, and these are the things that we will be praying into. Now, as you can imagine, and we'll highlight some of the details in these sessions, but as you can imagine, each one of these themes would have a, just a multitude of prayer topics. They're all, uh, you, you know, just a lot of detail in each and every one of them. Uh, and obviously we would have to be led by, we will have to be led by the Spirit as to how we pray into any and all of these but these are the four themes that we'll be dealing in, uh, in this class uh, as part of God's eternal uh, purpose. Uh, so that's, the, uh, that's kind of the introduction. Now we want to get into uh, praying and, and talking about uh, praying for the rise of the corporate man. Uh, first, let me just, before we get into the prayer aspect of it, I want to just talk about uh, the, the purpose of the church age and the ultimate goal of that to be, to be the coming forth of the, of the corporate man. Uh, on page two of your notes, it, it, I've written this, in order to understand what is involved in praying for the coming forth of the co mature corporate man, let's begin with a brief summary of the ultimate goal of the church age. Now, we'll look at four passages of scripture uh, one we just, uh, we just read, the one from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. We see that, there, that the church will birth from its womb a mature corporate man, a, a man-child, a corporate son. Uh, and so uh, let me just talk about some of these scripture verses, and then I'll come back and try to put it all into context. So... There, there's this corporate son that must be birthed from the womb of the church, which is an overcoming son, a man-child made ready. Uh, the second scripture verse 
um, is Revelation 19, 7. And let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And so we see another dimension of the ultimate purpose of the church age what is to make ready the bride. And so we see that in this, uh, going back to Revelation, let me go back to Revelation 12, 1 through 5, we see that when this man-child is made ready, the man-child is caught up to heaven, the dragon is cast to earth, and all of the activity that related to that initiates the last three and a half years of the church age, the tribulation period of that age. And so we see that that, that is a part of the goal of the church age is to birth this what we call a first fruits uh, group of people called a corporate man-child. And then three and a half years later, the bride will, will have been made ready, Revelation 19, 7. And then right after that, the Lord returns. Uh, and so what we see is this man-child at the midpoint of the tribulation period, the bride made ready at the end, producing the second coming of Christ. That, in other words, the goal of the church age. Now, the man-child includes the bride, the corporate son. The bride uh, includes the uh, the sons for the father. They're all the same people. Uh, a, a mature son for the father, a bride made ready uh, for the son. But Revelation is not the only place where we see this objective of the church age to make ready a, a people who take on the image of Christ and are made ready for him. We see also uh, in this next scripture I want to refer to, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. Uh, we see this. This is what Paul wrote. Now remember Ephesians is the book, the primary book about God's eternal purpose. Um, and he said that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And so in the context of the bride, because if you read if you read Ephesians chapter 5, you'll quickly see that Paul is talking about marriage. He's talking about a bridal relationship. And even later in the chapter, he even says that, you know, all these things related to, the, to a marriage are true, but he really is talking about the, the relationship between Christ and the church to be a bride. And so, again, we see the goal of the church age that the Lord will present to himself at his second coming the, the bride who has been made ready, one who is holy, one who is blameless, one who has no spot or no wrinkle uh, upon her. So we see that, again, that objective of the church age. Now, we, one more scripture verse related to this uh, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, talking about the fivefold ministry. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So in other words, the fivefold ministry, that's their goal, is to build up the body of Christ in, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and here's what I really want you to see, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belong, belongs to the fullness of Christ. So again, we see that, that the church is to work on the earth until this objective of this mature man, this corporate man, uh, comes forth. And so when we're talking about the need for a praying for the corporate man, we're seeing that the eternal purpose of the church age is to produce this corporate man. Uh, it's to produce a people who will be uh, mature sons for the heavenly father, will be uh, a bride made ready for the son, and will be a body uh, who will inhabit the fullness of the spirit uh, for the, as a temple for the Holy Spirit. That's the goal of the church age. Now, 
you know, when you look around, and of course, this, we covered a lot of this in God's eternal purpose class. But if you look around the earth, if you look around the church of, of the earth, what do you see? You see very little emphasis uh, from, the, from, the, from the standpoint of FIFO ministry uh, it, to make these people ready. You see the church not focused on that. The church is focused on signs and wonders. It's on, focused on people getting healed, people walking in prosperity, or uh, it, those that are not focused on that are focused on uh, leading people into the kingdom. And so, you know, all those are important. I, I, I believe in all of that. I, uh, obviously, we believe in uh, evangelism and leading people into the kingdom. But there's very little emphasis on making the people who come into the house of God mature, to, care, to take on the fullness of Christ. Uh, and so... That's the purpose of the church age. And for the purposes of our class, not only do we need, is that a need, and not only is there a need for discipleship and, and teaching and uh, the, the need to call for people to make themselves ready or to take on the image of Christ in fullness, there is a need for prayer. There is a need uh, for prayer. The pri God's primary purpose for the church age is to prepare a corporate man who will be made ready as God's eternal partner. Uh, and then because that is the goal, the, there is a need for prayer. There, there, we, we, must, uh, we must pray into these uh, things. The church must grow. I'm, I'm in pay, on page four in your notes, praying for the arising of the corporate uh, man. Um, the church must grow into maturity so as to be made ready. Now, this may seem just obvious, but when people are born again, they are not mature. They're not made ready as a bride for Christ. They're not already ready as a bride for Christ. They're betrothed as a bride, but they're not made ready as an eternal wife of the Lamb. The same is true with the man-child of Revelation chapter 12. Uh, they've come into the kingdom, but they're not mature. And so the church has to, has to grow into this kind of maturity. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is there are a lot of prayer points that come out of this one simple truth that the church must, be, must mature into, these, into this goal that God has for the corporate man. You know, some of the things that uh, I've just jotted down uh, that are in the scriptures, I'm not taking the time to, to write all the references down for them, but that the church and individual believers must be filled unto fullness with Christ. You know, Colossians and Ephesians and a lot of these uh, 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 epistles of Paul talk about that, that for the maturity they must be filled unto fullness with Christ. They must be in full union with Christ in body, soul, and spirit. Now the moment we're born again, our spirit becomes one with the Holy Spirit and we are in full union in our spirit, but out of that spirit, union in the spirit, our soul, our mind, our will, uh, uh, our emotions must come into union with Christ as well as our body uh, and the, the, the cravings of our flesh and all of those types of things must, to come, must come into union with Christ in order to come into maturity. We, the, another point is that, that believers must live in an intimate dining relationship with Christ, an intimate dining relationship with with Christ. Part of maturity is for people to enter into that type of relationship. The message to the church at Laodicea would say that. The individual believers in the church must be conformed into the image of Christ so that when people see us individually and see the church, they don't see the people in all their weaknesses as much as they see Christ formed in them. Uh, the fifth point here is to be passionately in love with Christ. So we see a pe we want to see a people who are hungry and thirsty for the Lord, passionately in love 
with him, where the things of the world have grown strangely dim in light of that, that love relationship with Christ. And so we see that the, the church has to grow into these things. Looking at it from a little bit different perspective, and uh, my son Brian did a message. Uh, it was the dated August the 8th of 2021, so as I'm teaching this relatively recently, it spoke a message at our home church, and it's on our Radical Pursuit uh, website, uh, radicalpursuit.org. I think it's .org or .net. Uh, it's uh, one of those. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it, it has that message on here. But he listed 12 uh, traits of the bride made ready, 12 traits of the mature man made ready. Uh, the, and I'll just go through them quickly. They're in your notes. The bride made ready uh, will love Jesus as her all-consuming first love. The bride made ready uh, will be faithful to the lamb in the face of persecution and even death. The bride made ready will wholeheartedly love the truth, seek the truth, obey the truth, and proclaim the truth. The bride made ready will overcome Jezebel and resist her influence in every area of our lives and spheres of authority. The bride made ready will overcome spiritual apathy and slumber and will be wide awake for the coming of the bridegroom like a wise virgin uh, whose lamp is filled with oil and whose light is burning brightly. The bride made ready will persevere in the victory of Christ until the end. The bride made ready will burn with the fire of God, jealous love for his beloved son as this fire removes all that hinders first love in our hearts, souls, and bodies, including lukewarmness and self-satisfaction. She will enter into a dining relationship of deep uh, e internal intimacy with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The bride made ready will have her self-life fully crucified by the Holy Spirit and will live fully by the indwelling life of Christ, empowering her to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, and to be internally possessed by the Spirit of God. The bride made ready will be an equally yoked wife, having the lamb's nature formed deeply within her heart and soul, making her lamb-like in character. The bride made ready will be glorious within, having no spot, stain, or wrinkle internally, or, or externally. Uh, she will be pure in heart and holy in action. The bride made ready will follow the lamb wherever he goes, living in moment by moment reliance and absolute obedience to the indwelling spirit. And then the final one, the bride made ready will have purified lips that only speak the truth in love. Um, now, uh, as I read through these, I think, man alive, I'm way, way, way short on, a, on almost all of these. And I'm thinking maybe you're feeling the same way. But God is able uh, to make us all ready. Uh, but that's the goal. That's, that's, that's kind of like the, uh, the ultimate objective of the church age is for this mature corporate people to come forth who take on all these characteristics. Now, I don't believe we can reach perfection per se, because even in our, as we draw our last breath, we'll still be uh, being transformed into this image of Christ more and more and more from glory to glory in fullness. But we're on that journey. We, we have to be on that journey. The church must be on that journey. And as we're on the journey, we'll achieve a measure of all of these things. Uh, and Somehow, some way, Christ will have this remnant of people, this man-child, this bride who has been uh, made ready. But for the purposes of this class and the purposes of this session, for these traits and others, again, this is page five in your notes, for these traits and others to emerge in believers, the church must partner in prayer with the Holy Spirit for the corporate man to mature. Now, that, that's really, this is really an important point for us in this session. Uh, you know, we can, we can be messengers who we call people to this. We can be master builders where we try to help pastors and leaders 
to create a spiritual environment in their churches where these types of messages and, and truths are taught and emphasized and encouraged for people to come into them. We can do all these things, but that's not enough. We have to also pray uh, for these things to take place. Prayer is crucial uh, in this. Now, let's look at a, I want to, I want to look at, I won't take too much time with each one, but there are five prayers that Paul prayed in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians that kind of speak into the prayer for these things to take place, for these things to come forth, uh, which shows that, that Paul not only uh, called people to prayer, Paul prayed, and, and in the sense that these are written in the New Testament, they are also a call to us to pray for these things that we just talked about uh, to come forth uh, in, in reality. So Paul, the Apostle Paul draws a real strong parallel to these things that need to take place uh, with prayer for them to take place. Very important uh, that we see this connection and this need uh, for prayer. So let's look at a, a, a little bit at these. Um, one point about these, uh, these three, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, these are Paul's prison epistles. They were written during that two-year period that he was in the renting quarters in, in Rome. And so they were all written about the same period of time. And they're all, you know, Ephesians is the book that highlights the eternal purpose more than the others. But Colossians and Philippians also have a lot of information related and connected to God's eternal purpose. And so these prayers were all kind of part of that overall issue related to God's eternal purpose and the fulfillment of his eternal, eternal purpose. So let's look at these, these prayers. Look at, this is look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 23, and I won't read the whole thing. But you can see there, Paul wrote this, he said, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, he says this, I do not cease giving thanks for you while make, making mention of you in my prayer. So Paul is basically saying that I am praying uh, for the church and the Ephesian church specifically here. And look at what he prays. Verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, to know him and to, and to know his purpose and to know uh, what he is uh, saying and, and to, to give insight into truth. Uh, verse 18, And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, the hope of his calling. Now, what is he talking about, the hope of his calling? He's just talked in, earlier in this same, very same chapter about the calling of God's eternal purpose. And he's saying, I pray that you'll know, you'll understand the hope of this calling. You'll, I pray in that you will understand what God's eternal purpose is uh, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. His Inheritance in the saints. What is his inheritance in the saints? A mature son for the father. A bride made ready for the son. He's saying, I'm, I'm praying that you'll, you'll know these things. And then he's also saying, I'm praying that you will know what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. In other words, it's impossible apart from God, but there's a great power of the Holy Spirit that is available to us. And he's praying that this power would come forth uh, to make people ready into the fullness of all these things. Uh, and so it goes on, but that's enough for that one. And then you see this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 19, you see a very similar types of things, different issues he's praying for. But he's praying for the people. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you may be rooted and grounded in love and may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth 
and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Why? Uh, so that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. He's praying these things so, so that we can be filled, and that's one of the objectives for the fullness of Christ to fill us. He's praying these things. You see him praying these things. Uh, Ephesians 6, 18, I won't go into that one. That one's about praying for him uh, in the context of spiritual warfare as he goes into the nations. But it's, again, another prayer. But Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, And I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order, in, in, look why, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. The bride made ready, pure, pure and blameless, uh, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, you know, filled up with Christ, uh, in, in through the, through which comes through Christ to the glory and praise of God. Another, again, another prayer related to this goal, this eternal purpose goal of Christ filling us all in all. Uh, and then Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 12. For this reason, since the day we heard uh, about it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, of Christ's will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects and to bear fruit in every good work and to increase in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Again, all these prayers focusing on different Aspects and from different approaches, but they all come as prayer for the eternal purposes of God, the, the rising of the corporate man, the, the rising of the bride made ready to come forth. And so the point that I'm making is that Paul knew the importance of prayer into these things in order for them to come forth. It's not an automatic thing. It's not just enough. It's not just enough to say to somebody, you need to take on the image of Christ. It's not just enough to say you need to be in full union with Christ. It's not such enough that you need to have an intimate dining relationship with Christ. Those are important. We'd have to be a voice. Forerunners must be a voice into the church. If you're going to be a forerunner, you must speak these, tru these truths in love. If you're going to be a master builder, you have to create an environment uh, that where these things are taught on a regular basis, day after day, week after week. But none of that is enough. We also must pray. Now, when Paul wrote this, he didn't really say, you need to pray these things. He says, I pray these things. So Paul, as one who was the forerunner to forerunners, the messenger, the master builder, all of these things, he also Prayed. He also prayed into these issues. Now, that's the challenge to us. If we're going to be that, uh, that messenger, that master builder, that forerunner, we too must pray. We too must pray into these things. Therefore, there is a need for an eternal purpose house of prayer where the people who are involved in this, this function, uh, labor, travail even, uh, to, to pray that these things uh, would come forth. It's a mandate. Verse 6, page 6 in your notes, point 3. Prayer for the mature corporate man to arise uh, is a mandate to the church, to, the, to all the church, but definitely the church that's focused on God's eternal purpose. Forerunners have to be the beginning of that, but it's not just limited to those who are called as forerunners. Uh, I believe the entire end-time church is called to pray into this corporate man to arise. One of the things that's been just increasing in my heart, in my spirit, over the times that I've been writing this class uh, is that forerunners are all summoned 
to the golden altar. I know we talked about it a little bit in session one, and we, I shared the, the testimony, the story of how uh, when Terry Bennett was at our church in 2015 and how he came and, and a being came into the meeting that Saturday morning and with a summons to the golden altar. And if you begin to just research the, the meaning of summons, and we talked about this, I know. Uh, if you begin to do, just research the meaning of summons, to the, go, of the word summons, it's like a policeman or sheriff comes to your house and he gives you an order that you have to report, maybe do jury duty or uh, you're being sued or something like that, whatever it might be. But you have, when you get a summons, you have no choice. It's not like an option. It's not like an invitation to a birthday party where if you have something else going on, you can say, well, I'd love to come, but I really can't come. A summons is a mandate. A summons is a mandate. And so because prayer is crucial to the coming forth for prayer by forerunners for the church to come forth into this corporate man expression, there is a summons, a mandate that is not optional. In my opinion, <coughs> and I think it's more than an opinion, I think it's from the Lord, it's not optional for forerunners to take up this call to pray for the corporate man to arise and all that's involved in it. It's a mandate to that. I know our mentor that uh, we've mentioned so many times, Noel Mann, he said this a number of times. He said that you can't be a forerunner without being an intercessor. And he's right. I believe he's right. And no matter where you are on that journey, I wanted to start out in session one with that journey because you may not be anywhere near that in your own personal journey of intercession. That's okay. But the call is there and we need to take that step of journey, uh, on the journey to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to transform us so that we can pray into that, corp that role of people becoming this part of this corporate man uh, company, this bride made ready. And so this leads to the next point. Um, you know, I, I, I had mentioned in the notes, and I won't go there now, but in Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 8, part of this summons, this mandate, uh, the golden bowls of incense must be full before all this takes place. There's several things that have to take place before the Lord returns. The bride has to be made ready. The man-child has to come forth. The gospel has to be preached throughout the, 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 the earth in, in fullness. And the golden bowls, bowls of incense must be filled with eternal purpose prayers of the saints. And there are other things, I'm sure. But those four things have to take place before the Lord returns. So there's a mandate there. For that. Now, point four, again on page six, an eternal purpose house of prayer must labor until Christ is formed in a people in fullness. Now, you know, a couple of scripture verses. One is Galatians chapter four, verse 19. Uh, My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. He said, Paul was saying, I'm in labor until Christ is formed in you. The King James says, I am in travail, which is an intense form of, of labor. The last stages of giving birth, there's a kind of a travail to birth uh, uh, someone or a, a baby. And what, this is what Paul is writing. I'm in labor. I'm in travail, birth, a birthing travail to give birth until Christ is formed inside of his church. Now, there's more to it than prayer in this scripture verse. He's in labor. He's in labor to go to the nations. He's in labor to speak the word. He's in labor to write letters to correct and to bring people into maturity. But a major aspect of it is Paul is saying, I am in travail. I am in labor through prayer, intercessory prayer, until Christ is formed in his church. So we see the call to prayer there. 
We see the same in Revelation chapter 12, which we talked uh, about at the very beginning of this session. We talked about it and we said that, you know, the woman is in labor. The woman is in travail, King James, and tr is in travail until Christ, uh, until the man-child, which is taking on the nature of Christ in fullness, has been birthed out of the womb of the church. The, here we are. Here's where we are. The man-child is, well, let me say it this way. The woman is pregnant with the man-child. The woman is at the last stages, at the point of birth in labor. And this is where the church is. The church, we're at that point in history where the woman, the church, is carrying this man-child. And there must be travail, labor, prayer, deep, deep intercession with a full heart, not just going through the motions on a Wednesday night for an hour because your pastor has called you to that. A laboring, a burden as forerunners to see the, the birth of this mature corporate man where Christ is formed in, in a people in fullness. That's where God is leading us. And if we want to be this part of this uh, end time, eternal purpose, house of prayer, we must be a part of that. Now, another scripture verse. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 29. I'm not going to read all of that, but it talks in here about the all creation is groaning uh, for and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. But then right after that, it says, even we ourselves groan, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. Now, this adoption as sons is what is talking about the corporate gathering uh, unto the father of the sons who have matured to be made ready. We're, we're waiting for that, but while we are, we are groaning. Again, travailing. Burden prayer for all of this to come forth. And then it, this passage closes with, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of the Son. That doesn't mean it's going to predestine to happen. It's, pre, it's the predestined plan for the, for the Son to be conformed into the image of the Son so that he would be, Christ would be the firstborn among many brethren. See, again, Prayer, groaning, long, and it doesn't have to be a literal groaning or a literal travailing. That if the spirit leads that, it's great. But it can be in the flesh. And I'm not saying a fleshly groaning or travailing. But what I am saying is a burden, a burden, heartfelt, sincere prayer for the man child, the mature son, the bride to come forth out of the womb of the church to be made ready uh, for these things. Okay, now let me just close with this. I have, uh, I think, 10 prayer points just to kind of give you an idea of the kind of things. I think you're already seeing these things. But here's some prayer points that you can use to, as you begin to pray for this corporate man to arise. Lord, make ready your bride by clothing her with wedding garments of righteousness. You know, you can pray into those kind of things. Lord, lead your church to overcome and to be a company of overcomers. Lord, form Christ in your people in fullness. Lord, draw your people into closer union with you. Lord, lead your church to greater intimacy with Christ. Lord, empower your church to dine with you. Lord, create in your church a passion and a love sickness for you. Lord, we ask for a fresh revelation of the love of the Father and the Son for your church. Lord, wake up your church and cause them to keep their lamps alight. Lord, produce a healthy fear of the Lord in your church that they might be a people made ready. Now, there are a lot of other things you could pray along this. this is, and, and obviously you have to be led by the Spirit because if you take a corporate group that meets for an hour, hour and a half to pray into these things, 
you might only be able to pray into one or two of these different issues or three, not to all of them for sure. But as you're led by the Spirit, the Spirit will lead you to pray into these uh, various uh, topics and subtopics around this major theme. I know our church, we've still got a long way to go. I know we have a long way to go. But we've come a long way as well. It, it used to be, uh, and one of our members said this, who's been part of our prayer groups for a long, long time, it used to be that nobody would ever open their mouth to pray hardly anything. But now it's hard when you come to our prayer meeting to get in a prayer because so many people are jumping one after another. And I love it. It's great. It's wonderful. Uh, and so we've come a long way. And you'll come, if you're, no matter where you are, if you're only at the beginning stages, you'll come a long way too. Uh, but it's a challenge to us all to step up and to realize that if the corporate man is going to arise, there must be prayer. There must be prayer. There must be a company of forerunners, a, a, a part of the church, the womb of the church, to birth this corporate man, the mature son, the man-child who will initiate the, first, the last three and a half years of the church age, and then the bride made ready that will conclude the church age where Christ will return. We must fill the golden altar bowl, golden bowls of incense at the golden altar with the prayers of the saints one major topic being praying for the corporate man to arise. Let's do it. Amen.